When I interview someone, I want to go beyond events, even life-shaping ones. I want to understand how that person feels as their life unfolds in that moment and what they take with them for all the following moments. I know I've done the story justice when I'm emotionally vested. My heart skips a beat or I smile, or even the tears flow naturally. And even for a moment, I feel I've played a small role in sharing this aspect of their life. Looking through the eyes of others has opened my eyes to a world that I used to only read about on paper, but never knew. I now know what it means to live with an eating disorder or other mental health conditions, or move in a wheelchair in an inaccessible world, or the pain and uncertainty of leaving almost everything and everyone behind, either as a refugee or even an immigrant choosing to seek a better life. A parent dealing with their child taking their life, a small businessman or woman tirelessly chasing their dreams, an athlete seeking a podium, artist who wants to sing for their supper. I know the pressures of what it means to be a thought leader, the anger that can arise from a strong opinion, and how fast life can change with the wrong health diagnosis. And I've learned to really admire the people that choose to make their life for a greater good. I think it's changed me, made me less judgmental of my flaws, less overcome with my uncertainties, and more optimistic for our collective future. Today, I want to share the story of Vicki Cody. She's a woman who has stood by her husband for over 30 years, but at the same time, has become a role model and an accomplished author. It's a powerful love story of two soulmates, the children that have resulted, but also one that very early on in the relationship introduced a third lover into their mix, her husband's many decades of love for his military service. Her husband is Dick Cody. He's the 31st Vice Chief of Staff in the United States Army. And Vicky's been with them, sometimes oceans apart, as he served in the evacuation of Vietnam and later when he's in the Gulf during Operation Desert Storm. Over their 33 years together, they moved 18 times. And she raised her family of two sons. She would also see them turn into Apache helicopter pilots for the famed 101st Airborne Division. This story will take you to places that only the most courageous go and where the word sacrifice can often mean one's life. But as you listen, do so marching in Vicki Cody's footsteps, the footsteps of an army wife. This is Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. Vicki Cody, welcome to Chatter That Matters. Thanks, Tony. It's great to be here. I appreciate that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful book that you've written, uh, Army Wife. You know, so often when we think of the military, it's through the eyes of a Hollywood producer. You know, or we see clips from a newsreel. And there's no question that our forebears, people like your husband, there's nothing but admiration for those who choose to serve. But after reading your book, it opened my eyes to the sacrifice of the people left behind, the ones expected to create a home, raise a family, try to have their own sense of identity, a life within the abnormalities, the unpredictability, and the risks of military life. I guess that was your intent with the book is just to let people know that it takes two to tango. Exactly. And and I appreciate your in-depth look at, at all of this um, and not just looking at the surface of, oh, this is another book about army life or whatever, because my intent has always been with my writings to kind of pull back the curtain and give the reader a look behind the scenes of not only the, the brave men and women that choose to serve our nation, but those families that stand right beside them, whether it's a spouse, their kids, the mom and dad, a grandparent. You know, every soldier has a family supporting him or her. And those people are often, you know, on the sidelines and don't get the recognition. And, and not that that was my whole intent, um, because I don't feel like, I've done anything heroic. I just stood by the the man that I fell in love with, never dreaming where this was going to take us. Um, but yes, my intent is to and and also, you know, to give something to other military people to relate to. So many um, service members and their families read my books and say, oh, my gosh, that took me right back to or I remember feeling the same way. But also for those non-military readers like you to read it and say, wow, I had no clue. I never dreamed that that's what it's really like. You talk about this powerful love that you have. But I would say that if you knew what you're signing up for back then as 
handsome as you described Dick Cody in your youth. <laughs> I wonder, would you have signed up for that? Because yes, you are a hero. You made tremendous sacrifices. And you also, I think during your life, came out of your shell and decided to become a role model for a lot of other people that were wondering, this isn't the the fairy tale marriage that we expect where people go off to work and come home and spend every night together. I think it's like so many other couples. You meet, you fall in love. I never looked beyond his his West Point uniform. He was so handsome and cute. And I thought, wow, this is like really fun and exciting. I had no clue what I was getting into, but it just evolved like love does. You know, we, we fell in love and, and there's just something about Dick Cody. Well, both of us, our relationship, you know, it's like, there's this connection that's, that's here. Even today, we just celebrated 48 years of marriage. Um, and 33 of those years were in army life. Um, but anyway, it was like early on, I just, I, we were together. We were going to do this together, this journey. We didn't really know where it was going to lead. I, I guess I thought maybe Dick would do his four year commitment after West Point, go back home, help run the family businesses in Montpelier, Vermont. But I saw immediately um, that he absolutely loved what he was doing. And he wasn't even a pilot then. This was just when he was like in transportation corps stationed in Hawaii, but he loved it. And then when he went to flight school a year after we got married, that was the real turning point. That was when I saw the real Dick Cody who absolutely loved flying helicopters. And from from that time on, there was no turning back. We never once thought about going back to Vermont. It was always what's next, what's on the horizon, what new helicopter was he going to learn to fly? Yeah, I'm sure if somebody had said to me at that young Vicky Cody that was, well, Vicky Hevener at the time, um, if someone had said, Vicky, you know, you and Dick, you're going to move all over the world for the next 33 years. You're going to raise your kids, move them around. You're going to be left alone a lot. You're going to lose friends in helicopter crashes. It's not going to be easy. I would have, I would have turned and run the other way, but you know, you don't know that you, so you just go in and I was all in and Dick was all in and, and we just made it work for us and our, our sons. So I just want to give our audience this context of, because your writing is so wonderful. And you, I want to go back to the summer of 69. I know you're where you grew up because I'm, I'm from Montreal, but you're 16 years old. You swept up in the music of the day. You got this new driver's license. Since, and then this name Dick Cody starts to flicker on your radar. He was the, the hunk of the town, I guess. He was the athlete. He was everything, right? Yeah. I was from Burlington. Dick was from Montpelier. And the way we met was his his cousin was dating my sister and they ended up getting married. Um, so that was the, the connection. That was the only way I'd heard the name Dick Cody. And I had heard his name. He was a few years older. So uh, really, by the time I was paying attention, he was already at West Point. But I knew the name. Um, you know, he was the big basketball star of Vermont. And but I just knew what his cousin would always say. Oh, you know, my cousin Dick Cody's a cadet at West Point. He's just the greatest guy ever. And so then I meet him and it was like this instant <laughs> connection I had never met anyone like him. But, you know, at the time I'm 16, he's 19. And, and I think both of us just thought it was this little schoolgirl crush, you know, infatuation. I did not know what it would lead to, but then it was like, you know, we just started dating and every time he came home, we would go out and it was just, the connection was stronger and stronger. He'd come home from West Point, but in your book, you talk about when Harmy Bove, I think was the person that was killed. Oh, yes. And the reality of the Vietnam War, even though he was safe in West Point and you're very mm -hmm. proud of him and you said he just looked gorgeous in his military yeah. uniform, <laughs> did you start to connect the dots that what he was training for was potentially what Harmy Bove lost his life for, which was just serving the country? Honestly, Tony, at, at that age, you know, by then I was probably 17. I knew so little about the military. My No one in my family had served. No one in Dick's family had served. So I, I was still thinking of him just as a West Point cadet. I was not thinking... I guess I, I was too naive to even think he might go to Vietnam. Say that we are mired in stalemate. 
seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. The pilots reported by radio that the situation was out of control. And then by the time we were getting serious, he, you know, and when Dick graduated in 72, Vietnam was definitely winding down. I, I just think I was naive and in, in love. The other part of your book that I found fascinating, you know, you say opposites attract. And yes, you'd come mm-hmm. home and, you know, yeah. you talk about the first kiss and everything looks wonderful. <laughs> but you also talk, you go to the University of Vermont, which is just ranked in the top three, not for education, but by Playboy for party. <laughs> you got sandal wearing hippies and yet yeah. Dick is at West Point. And you describe it as the overachieving crop of credits. You had marijuana, they had muskets. How, how did you find common ground that, you know, how did this, he not suddenly look, appear very stiff and rigorous yeah. when he came home? I mean, how did that? I don't know. Maybe that was the big, that was part of the attraction. It was like, you know, our, our college experiences were the total opposite. But I so loved going to West Point, seeing him march in the parades, going to the football games. I absolutely loved everything that he stood for and his fellow cadets. But then he would come up to the University of Vermont and go to some keg parties and frat parties with me. And for him, it was like he was like living his best life because he couldn't do that at West Point. Everything was, you know, so strict and regimented. So he enjoyed coming to my campus and experiencing the typical college life. But, you know, at the end of the day, you you talk about, you know, different backgrounds, whatever. Dick and I, even though that was very different, our college experiences, and he was from a large Catholic family. I was from a very small, I three kids in my family, small family, non-practicing Episcopals. We didn't really go to church. So that part of it was different. What was exactly the same for both Dick and I, we came from very strong family units where our parents were respected and revered. Neither one of us ever did anything against like our parents' wishes. We both came from very loving homes where the family was very, very important. And I think that was one of the core values that we each appreciated in the other person because you don't always see that. Yes, but you're heading off to visit him on campus and he's visiting you on campus. Did your strict parents kind of go, these two people are in love and we've got to trust them that they're going to do the right thing? Or was a lot of this happening that they really didn't know what was going on? No, no. My parents, because I was a good kid, so they had no reason not to trust me. Now, Dick's parents being Catholic, very devout Catholic, they were probably shaking their heads a little bit. And and certainly once Dick got stationed in Hawaii and I would go visit him for the summer, all the parents like weren't exactly pleased. But both of us, we always just said to our parents, you got to trust us. We're going to end up getting married. But, you know, the point was I was still I was starting college when he was finishing. But that was a time, you know, that was the early, late 60s, early 70s, when that's when people did start, you know, kind of living together and and doing all that. Um, So, yeah, my parents, they only got upset towards the end when they thought that Dick wasn't going to marry me because it was kind of dragging on for a while and he ended up deploying and the wedding got canceled. My parents said, well, I, want to go, I want to go back to that because I don't want to lose that. I just, because trust okay. is a big part of the story. Yes, He's exactly. in Hawaii, a tall, gorgeous guy. You're back home studying. And you talked about casually dating and you were convinced that he was casually dating. How did you trust each other to know that what might have been just uh, escaping boredom wouldn't have turned into one or both of you falling in love with different people? Tony, I know it, it probably sounds very old fashioned. I, I knew from the very beginning, once I really fell for Dick and I was old enough to know that I was in love with him, probably by the time I was maybe, I don't know, 18 or 19, you know, we had those years of dating. And I I remember one time Dick just turned to me when we were still young and we had only dated a couple of summers. He just turned to me and said, you're the girl I'm going to marry. We each just knew that. I was a very confident person. I always knew that Dick Cody would never find anyone better for him than me. I just knew it. I thought, well, he can date all he wants, but I know that there's not going to be anybody out there that's the right person for him. And he felt the same way about me. 
Um, so we just totally trusted each other. And I knew that that he needed to do his thing over there in Hawaii. You know, he was a bachelor in paradise. I wasn't expecting him to stay home and do nothing. I was okay with that. I love when you said your parents were wondering if you're ever going to ask. So, but after six years and you're about to get married, you've actually converted, you know, yeah. to, to honor his family's uh, spirituality. Mm-hmm. And you get a phone call one day from Dick as you're sort of thinking you're heading into the final stretches for your wedding. What what did yes. Dick have to say to you on that phone call? Just when I thought it was safe. Yeah. He calls me at my sorority house there at the University of Vermont. And he says uh, in a real serious voice, uh, Vicki, I can't tell you much, but uh, cancel the wedding. I'm deploying. And I'm thinking, deploy? What? I don't get what's that. He says, I'm going away. And I said, well, where? He said, I can't tell you. He said, just watch the news. So this is April 1975. A couple of days later, I look on the news and sure enough, there is uh, the fall of Saigon and they're pulling uh, refugees. They're pulling, they're evacuating Saigon and bringing all the refugees. um, They took them to the island of Guam. So I put two and two together. I figured, well, he can't be in Vietnam because it's, it's gone, you know. So then finally, I get a call from him a few weeks later on a two way radio. And he tells me he's on the island of Guam helping with the uh, refugee operations and that he would be gone for a couple of months. And he starts to really make a name in the military. I mean, this is where you said he stands out. And we'll talk a little bit about his incredible career. But I want to fast forward. You get married. Vietnam War is now over. You're in Hawaii. Seems like the setting's perfect. But you have to make some major adjustments. And one of them that you talk about is it wasn't just the culture in general that was changing. The military was changing. And not for the better. You know, you talked about budget cuts, PTSD, discipline problems, drinking and drugs. Even as for an army wife, you know, your husband enjoying happy hour at the officer's club and they've got topless dancers in excessive drinking. How hard was that for you to kind of say, I think my husband's fallen in love with the military and he's going to be there for his life to feel that you were at least on equal standing with the military of not being where you should have been first of all equals. During that time in Hawaii, that was my educating process of of kind of learning about the army and and becoming a, you know, an army wife. And I remember during those times, I had a little sit down chat with Dick and I said, look, I just finished four years of college where I partied and I did everything and I had fun. And I said, you've been a bachelor for all these years having your fun. I said, I really think it's time to settle down. We don't need to be going to happy hour with the buddies every Friday night. I said, we're married now. I said, I'm tired of partying. I said, it's time to settle down. And and I think he was ready for that. He was just one that, you know, sometimes I had to tell him that he was ready for that. I remember going through that whole stage in er, very early in the marriage. I guess what I thought in those days was that the army was in charge. It wasn't so much that I still didn't see how much he loved it. I felt like the army was always dictating everything and, and Dick had to work long hours and I hardly ever saw him and he was always out in the field. And I remember resenting that piece of it, that the army was trying to take charge of our marriage. And I had to come to terms with that and kind of grow up a little bit and say, okay, Vicki, this is it. You married the man of your dreams. This is what he's chosen to do. This is his career. And we're going to make this work. Thanks for listening to Chatter That Matters. When we come back, Vicki and I talk about her new book, Army Wife, and more of the incredible stories behind a 33-year-old love affair between a heroic man and an equally heroic woman. Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman will return in a moment. Presented by RBC. It's Tony Chapman from Chatter That Matters. I ask Canadians about their money matters. We talk debt, inflation, interest rates, and many were worried and some felt they could lose everything. In response, RBC has created My Money Matters. It's a site where you gain financial knowledge. You learn how to manage debt, reduce stress. There's even tools and apps to help you deal with the realities of today. Visit rbc.com slash money matters. Your financial well-being matters to you and to RBC. And then ended up going to uh, the uh, Korea for a year. Seven days after my first son, Clint, was born. And off to Korea for a year, I flew Hueys and uh, OH-58s 
came back, went to the Cobra course finally, four days after my second son was born. So my timing has not been well. Mrs. Cody's a saint. And then certainly when we got to flight school, that's when, when I saw how much he loved flying, it made it easier for me to kind of accommodate, adjust, and learn to love it too. You're listening to Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. Today, my special guest is Vicki Cody. Her book is called Army Wife, and what inspires me the most is how she takes control of her life by becoming a mentor and a leader to other people living in similar circumstances. You talk about how much he loves this, and you realize that he's got such a talent for leadership and flying, but mm-hmm. you find out you're pregnant, and... Oh, yeah. How you break the news isn't exactly what I'd call ideal. It's like we got through the postponed wedding. Then I get pregnant with our first son and I find out the same time. And he's in flight school, which is just a nine month course. And when I tell him I'm pregnant, he says, oh, geez, that's great. But I'm going to Korea for a short tour right after flight school. So it coincided with we have our first son. And a few days later, he goes to Korea for a year. I was not a happy camper initially. Once again, I had to tell myself, Vicki, this is out of your control. You can either dig in your heels and be miserable while he's gone to Korea, or you can figure out what you're going to do and you're going to be, you know, with your baby. I chose to move back home. But yeah, you're right. This would happen over the years. Every time I would think that I had adjusted, matured, and I was okay with everything going on, then there'd be another little curveball thrown at me, you know, just out of the blue, some little deployment or separation. But all of that, every single thing, and I think you you saw that when you read the entire book, it was all of that that made me who I am and made Dick Cody who he is. It was those ups and downs. It wasn't this smooth life that just kind of progressed along and And it was never boring, (laughs) but I look back and I think I wouldn't trade any of those experiences because in every single one, I learned so much about myself. I learned about my husband. There must be some resentment because the way I read your book, it's almost that the military moves people around on a chessboard and they're not really thinking of the consequences. I'm not asking you to to take on the military, but just for me as a voyeur, you're about to have your first child and you're still going to go to Korea. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Each and every time, December 12th, 1985, a plane carrying 248 soldiers crash. You know a lot of these people. Yeah. You have to explain it to your two boys. Right. Like it's, I love the fact that you support each other because I think partners are always yeah. in different stages of growth. But I right. have to feel that at times that third lover is in the room causing a lot mm-hmm. of chaos. And that's the military that just seems to just act with precision versus necessarily the heart. Absolutely. That's why I have the subtitle of my book, Army Wife, a story of love and family in the heart of the army, because at the very core, it is these families and and love stories of not just Dick and I, but all these other people. Okay, and then you've got all around us the noise of the army, the military, whatever service it is. Sure. All of that kind of pulling you in different directions. And it's up to to me. I felt like it was up to me and Dick then to make it work. And sure, I, I there were times when there was resentment. And back then, I have to say, you know, the army, they didn't really consider the families as much. And, and I, I don't think I'm saying anything disparaging right here. But no, my husband had no choice. He gets orders for a short tour in Korea and he's going to go regardless of having a baby. It has changed dramatically. I can either touch on that now or we can touch on it later. But our son's generation, their families are considered more and more. Now, if it's a deployment to a combat zone, there's really no getting out of it. If the unit is going, everybody's going. But if it's like a short tour or something else, and if a wife is having a baby, then they do let them stay back. Our son got to stay back when he was leaving for Iraq because his newborn son was having surgery. He got to stay an extra month before deploying. So things have changed for the better. And my husband and I see that with our son's generation 
of service members. But back then, no, it, you got orders for something you went. You didn't say, oh, I don't want to go there. <laughs> so talk to me about your own identity. I mean, Dick Cody's had an incredible career. He's commanded armies. He's rescued refugees, spearheaded missions in Afghanistan and Iraq, father figure, leader to hundreds of soldiers, four-star general. It'd be pretty easy for you to just slip in the shadows of the limelight he's cast. Whether you chose not to or you had no choice but, you became really a force of human nature in terms of bringing an emotional connection to a lot of other partners who are at home, having to deal with the realities of what it means when their spouse is in the military. Did that happen when that sort of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, when your two young boys, Dick's in Egypt, and he says, when the pilots he's with is like, when did you decide that you weren't just there to counsel your sons when something tragic happened, but you were going to be much more? I think I always had that personality, a strong personality where I, I never really was in his shadow early on from captain as when he was a company commander and I was a brand new company commander's wife. I learned how to, to do that. And I, and I have to say, I loved it. I liked being a leader like Dick likes being a leader. I was always like that in high school and college, always running for some office. Uh, you know, I had no problem speaking in front of groups and, and all of that. So I, I think I have, luckily I had that personality because over the years I have seen many an army spouse or military spouse that really didn't have those traits And they would just kind of turn into themselves and they didn't really want to be in the limelight. They didn't want to be in front of groups speaking. They didn't want to be an advocate. They just wanted to kind of ride out their time as an army spouse. And and I totally get that. And I think that's fine. For me, I loved being Dick's partner. I loved working as a team, whether it was company command, you know, all the different commands, all the way up to division when he commanded the 101st Airborne Division. I loved that role of being an advocate, a mentor. I loved being a a role model for other spouses to look up to. And I never felt like I was the be all end all because I felt like everybody has a role to play. But at the same time, yes, I ha- we had these two sons that, you know, Dick was gone a lot. So a lot of it fell to me and I had to learn to navigate and walk that fine line with them when tragedy would strike. And and it happened in almost every unit we were ever in, whether it was just a a helicopter crash and we'd lose one or two people or the huge crash that happened in Gander in 1985 when we lost 248 people from our post. By then, our sons were old enough to know what was going on. What do you think they chose the military, given that they were part of this? Like, what made them decide they wanted to also follow in their dad's footsteps? Over the years, there were there were times when I would say to Dick, oh, my gosh, what are we doing to these kids? Moving them around every couple of years. They went to three high schools each. I thought, we have done so much damage. If these, these boys turn out OK, it's going to be a miracle. They They were always fascinated with what their dad did. I mean, let's face it. Dick was flying Apache helicopters, shooting rockets and missiles and doing all kinds of great things. And our sons were surrounded by other army aviators, you know, and Dick's soldiers. They loved that. Plus, they were surrounded by other army brats. And I want to say the majority of the young boys that Clint and Tyler grew up with, the majority of them just went right into the military, too. So for military kids, It's a natural transition. Some of them hate it, don't ever think about going in themselves. But for both boys, by the time they were in middle school, they started talking about it. And certainly high school, it was like, well, all I want to do is be a helicopter pilot like dad. I want to serve in the army just like dad. And Vicki, I'm very proud that you also got your wings and learned how to fly, (laughs) which which is terrific. Any parting thoughts for Husbands and wives left behind as their partners are either deployed overseas or consumed with their careers or chasing their passions, because that's really what you're a lot of what you do is provide that. Right. I say make the most of it. Enjoy the opportunities you're given because military life affords you an awful lot of opportunities, not just the travel, but experiencing 
cultures, meeting so many different people. For me, this is why I became an author. I, I didn't know I was going to do that early on. But writing about military life has become my passion and given me this whole career. After my husband retired from the army, it was kind of like, okay, now it's my turn to pursue what I want to do. But all those years leading up to that, it was preparing me for what I was really meant to do. So I don't look at it as that I sacrificed that much. I tried to enjoy every minute of it, make the most of it, learn from it, and come out of it prepared to to go on and do my own thing. Military culture has been under attack for how it's dealt with minorities and women, how it holds on to the status quo. But you're saying that it, it is changing. Yes. And, and actually, I have to say, in the 33 years that I was with my husband while he was in the military, we never came across, um, and, I, and I hope I'm not being naive, we did not see racism. We did not see gender issues. But my husband, we're both very inclusive people. So to us, we didn't look at people differently. They were all in uniform, serving the same nation and saluting the same flag. My husband never really had issues in his units. And he was part of the the generation that when women started coming into flight school and started coming into the units, our sons, that's all they've known is females alongside them in the military and deployed too. I know we never saw it as a big issue. We do think the military is making great strides. Everybody needs to learn at any given time. So Vicki, I always end my shows with my three takeaways. And, and the first is the word trust. How it has been the glue that has not only binded you and Dick Cody together, even in the early days, just trusting each other to be the best of who you wanted to be versus just being the best at supporting others. The second thing is when you talked about, I was always a leader. And I think a lot of times as we get into relationships, we sometimes sacrifice our individual purpose and passions and callings in favor of another. And very often that's because one's making a, a paycheck or one's doing something the other isn't. And I love the fact that you said, this is what makes us great. He's a leader and I'm a leader. And so I think never lose who you are. And the final piece of advice, which is I think such an important piece of advice for overcoming any circumstances is make the most of it. Mm -hmm. And I love what you said. If I knew what I was through, I probably would have ran. But at the end of it, you two are still madly in love. Two sons that are in the military. And as you said, it's my turn to shine now. And I, you certainly are. I think this army wife, Vicki Cody, I know certainly put links to the book in the into the uh, podcast notes. I'm honored that you shared your story with me on Chatter That Matters. Thank you so much, Tony. And I appreciate your your really thoughtful questions of digging deep behind the scenes. And like I said, not just going on the surface and asking the, the typical questions that I sometimes get asked. I appreciate that, that you get it and you seem to get me because your three takeaways are exactly what I would want people to take away from whatever I write about. I think the two of you are truly what the word power couple means, power in the right sense. So again, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. November 11th is a day of reflection and gratitude for the sacrifices made by countless individuals who fought to secure the freedoms we cherish in our beloved country. And the phrase, lest we forget, holds deep meaning. It serves as a reminder to honor the courage, resilience, and selflessness of not only those who fought, but all the families they left behind. Lest we forget is to ensure they're never erased from our collective memory. And the tradition of wearing a poppy originated from the famous war poem in Flanders Field. It's written by a Canadian, a doctor, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, during World War I. As it turns out, as these bombs fell and turned over the earth, Mother Nature gave us a gift. Dormant poppy seeds that were released and grew. And these bright red colors came to symbolize the bloodshed and sacrifices of those who fought in the war. And there's so many other ways in which we can support our veterans and make sure it's not only November 11th. I want to give a shout out to RBC Salute. It's an inspiring example of how individuals and organizations can make a profound difference in the lives of those who have served. This initiative, which began by a few like-minded colleagues, 
is one of RBC's newest employee resources groups, and their commitment is to the well-being of our veterans, reservists, families, and allies. They have a dual purpose, connecting servicemen and women and families and allies within RBC and also within the communities across Canada. Over the last year, as the group has ramped up, the team has held events and hosted guest speakers discussing various topics of interest. For instance, an organization called Wounded Warrior, focused on mental health for veterans, led a presentation earlier this year. Natalie Marchessault, a former navigator with the Canadian Air Forces, now head of global procurement with RBC and co-executive champion RBC Salute says, once people leave the service, the desire to serve doesn't leave. That commitment's in your belly. It doesn't go away. We all want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. RBC Salute aligns with RBC's mission of bringing people together through a sense of pride and purpose. It's Tony Chapman. Thanks for listening, and let's chat soon.